Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We are concluding, really uh, very distinctly, the first half of 1 Thessalonians. Uh, it's, it's very clearly divided into two segments, uh, chapters 1 through 3, and then chapters uh, 4 through 5. Uh, the chapters 1 through 3 is really a, a testimony. It is the history of the believers here uh, at the church of Thessalonica. Um, you all right back there? We're good? All right, we're good. So anyway, we are going to cover chapter 3. I, th I think he's beckoning you, if, if, if I understand that correctly. Uh, chapter 3 is the scene that we actually see back in Acts chapter 16 and 17, where Paul, again, just uh, by way of recap, he had spoken uh, at the uh, city of Philippi. He was thrown in prison. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were singing praises to the Lord. Of course, we know what happened there. The Philippian jailer hears these things and many others, and the Philippian jailer is saved. They are released. They go to the next city, which is Thessalonica. And there they preach the gospel. They run out of Thessalonica. They go to Berea. And then from Berea, they go to Athens. And here we pick up, and that's really what we're picking up here in chapter 3. And we'll read just the 13 verses of chapter 3 together. And that's where we pick up. Paul is here in Athens, as we'll read here in verse 1. So beginning there, it says, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And notice that word faith, if you are a note taker or a highlighter or an underli underliner, it appears at least four times in this chapter. <clears throat> Verse 3 says, So that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we uh, were with you, we kept telling you in advance, that we were going to suffer afflictions, and so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, for this reason, brethren, in all our distresses, our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now, we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoiced before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. And notice I said faith. I, I did hear one person reading this chapter and said, so that we may complete what is lacking in your face, which is a whole other subject. Verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you increase, to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Our Father, we would ask that you might bless these words. We pray that you would help us to receive them. Father, I do earnestly ask that I would not get in the way of these holy texts this morning. I pray that you would help us to uh, discern what Paul is saying here, but more importantly, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And we just ask your utmost blessing on us this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So this chapter divides neatly into three little segments, and I've entitled the first part, verses 1 through 5, Paul's Concern. And then verses 6 through 10 is Paul's encouragement, and verses 11 through 13 is Paul's prayer. <coughs> so beginning there in verse 1, as we've mentioned, after they had been run out of Thessalonica and Berea, they have come to Athens, and, and by the way, while you, if you turn back to Acts 17, don't do it this morning, but if you turn back and read that portion, you will remember that just like someone waiting for their flight, 
it says Paul was walking about this city full of idols. And it says that's where he encountered the, the folks at Mars Hill. And he was able to bring a tremendous sermon of the gospel there while in a city full of idols. But the reason that he was there and the reason he was alone was because he was waiting for Timothy to come back, having sent him. And so it says that he had great conflict. He said, when we could endure it no longer. And, you know, I, I thought about entitling this message, what to do when you can't do anything. Because that's what he was at. He, he couldn't do anything himself. He was in a place where he had great desire and great conflict about a group of individuals. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, how he loved these believers and he was concerned about them. And he, and he took it personally, their reception of the gospel. But he couldn't do anything because he was there in Athens. He received the counsel of his fellow workers there and said, you know, Paul, I think it's best that you stay here. And because he stayed there, we have Acts 17, and the gospel was presented there to those uh, idolaters there in that, in that place. And so he, th he thought it best to be left behind in Athens, and he sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And so obviously, Timothy is very prevalent in the New Testament. We see a couple of letters written to him, but we see him throughout the book of Acts, and we see him showing up in the other epistles as well. And Timothy was one of those reliable individuals. Now, if you were to read the, the book of 2 Timothy, and I know that I've looked through the book of 2 Timothy together here at the 11 o'clock hour, you will see that he is also human. He also had discouragements. He also had potential weaknesses. I won't call them weaknesses, but Paul encourages him about different things. But at the end of the day, Paul's um, opinion an evaluation of Timothy was that he was faithful and he was God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ. And I find it extremely encouraging this morning, even in the room that we sit in this morning, that we all can be fellow participants in the gospel. See, <clears throat> we just learned about Jamin Peck. And one of the things that we tried to point out is that the work of the gospel is real and going on right now. You don't have to go back to, to David Brainerd or David Livingston and find these old historic accounts of missionaries in the 1600s and 1700s and 1800s and how they went off to Africa with a machete and a King James Bible and they, they brought the gospel to these places. But the, the gospel is real and the gospel is working as we speak. And not only that, but that each one of us has a part in that. Quite frankly, I look forward to eternity and finding out what effect our little five-day, not well-attended vacation Bible school had in eternity because we prayed for the work in Indonesia. We prayed for people we'll never meet in Indonesia because we brought to light some things that some fellow believers are doing for the Lord. Perhaps our prayers for Damon and Elizabeth helped them get home because, you know, they had some issues getting there. So our effect will not be known until eternity, but we can all have a part in it. And that's encouraging to me this morning. He says, encourage you as to your faith. And again, I, I said four. I actually meant five. I have it underlined five times in, here, uh, in my Bible here. Verse uh, 2, verse 5, verse 6, uh, verse uh, 10 excuse me, verse 7 and verse 10. So five times you read the word faith. And, and of course, without faith it is impossible to God, but, to please God. But this in and of itself is talking about their belief. That is, their confession, what they have believed. Uh, and he says, I want to encourage them about what they have believed. And so if you read there in verse 3 and 4, Paul told them, he said, you are going to experience afflictions. And you're going to experience uh, tumults, and you're going to have persecution. And he says, we told you this beforehand so that it wouldn't take you by surprise. As a matter of fact, I've mentioned, I know the last couple of times that we've talked about this, probably every time, that I would like to think that perhaps they 
still bore the scars of Philippi, the city of Philippi, and that jail and the beatings that they endured when they came to this city. So they were, a, they were marked men. He says, this is what it's like to be a Christian. This is what it's like to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. People will hate you. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Well, because why would someone want to believe something that is going to cause them pain? We were talking during break that, that people will do anything to alleviate pain. They will believe anything to alleviate distress. And so here Paul and Silas show up to the gates of the city of Thessalonica and they say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved from your sins, and when you do, do it is sure that you will suffer for it. And so he tells them that we are destined for this suffering, for the name of the Lord Jesus. In 1 Peter, it says that this pleases God when we bear up under suffering for his name's sake, when we suffer for justly for his name's sake. And it says, among other things, that it reminds him of his son. <clears throat> when we think of the Lord Jesus at the, the time of remembrance each Sunday morning, we think of the suffering of the Lord Jesus. And without question, that pleases the Father as we consider the sufferings of the Lord Jesus. And we think about him dying on our behalf, him being the substitute. And it pleases the Father when it reminds us of his Son. In the same way, when we do what is right and we suffer for it, it reminds the Father of his Son. And that delights his heart. The temporary discomfort that comes from the sufferings of this world will be richly rewarded in heaven. Paul would go on to say in 1 Corinthians, he says, they are not worthy to be compared. If you have uh, someone, we know many who have experienced the, the, the trials of, of a deep sickness, even today we know that there are many who are, are very sick or perhaps with cancer. And in my mind, a poor, crude example of it is, is the doctor comes in and says, we have the treatment that is going to save your life. And the only thing you have to do is submit to this little needle going into your arm, and we can pump the medicine into your arm. And he says, well, I don't like needles. Well, isn't that right, Paul? I don't like needles. And he says, but if you don't do this, you will die. And I suppose, I, can't, I won't speak for Paul, but I suppose that he would probably say, well, I can endure the temporary pain that that needle will bring me if it will let me live. And so the idea that the pain that we endure for the name of the Lord Jesus is just a temporary discomfort, uh, procuring for us a reward that is far beyond our wildest imagination. <clears throat> Verse 5 says, For this reason, when I couldn't endure it no longer, I also sent to find out, about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. And so here we have, again, Paul taking it very personally, these believers' welfare. You know, we'll find out that he has, or we have already found out, that he has been praying constantly for these believers. And that is certainly something that we can do when we can't do anything else. It is something that God invites us to do and encourages us to do. Pray for one another. But he says, I had to find out. I had to have firsthand knowledge of your condition and your state in the faith. And he says, for fear that we, uh, the tempter might have tempted you. If you wouldn't mind, turn back to Matthew chapter 13. And this is one of uh, the Lord's more familiar parables. And I'd like to just read uh, the, the parable itself and then its interpretation. <clears throat> In verse 3 of Matthew 13, the 13, obviously full of many, many parables. And he said, and he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell in the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. 
he who has ears, let him hear. And then if you skip down to verse 18, the disciples ask what, quite frankly, I probably would have asked as well. And he uh, explains it to him. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what, he has, been, what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed has, was sown beside the road. And you can go ahead and read all the rest of that. But the first soil or the first condition is what I wanted to bring our attention to. And that is that when the gospel is preached, men must understand it. That's why when Philip runs up to the Ethiopian eunuch and he sees him reading the scroll of Isaiah, what does he ask? He says, do you understand what you are reading? Do you see this word of God? Do you understand it? Because if you don't understand it, the devil is ready and waiting to take that seed away from you. And so Paul is saying back in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 5, he says, we were concerned, I was concerned, that when the gospel was preached, there might have been some confusion. There might have been some misunderstanding. And I know that the devil is ready to take that seed away. And so he was concerned about it. And again, I mentioned this, that Paul took it personally. Now, obviously, we, we know that we cannot save anyone. And we often remark how that our job is to sow the seed, our job is to, to water, to plant, all these things. But God causes the growth. That's what the Bible says. But there is certainly an aspect of taking the responsibility to make sure that men are without excuse when they are around us. In other words, it needs to be said of us that we did not leave anything to chance, that we made sure that the gospel was clearly and effectively presented. And certainly, God will do the the saving work. But we need to make sure that our testimony and our words are clear so that the hearer understands. <clears throat> I read a quote uh, by H.A. Ironsides and it says, Let me assure you of this. In that coming day when we stand at the judgment seat of Christ, no one will be sorry because he was so completely yielded to the Lord. And I thought that was a tremendous quote that really speaks well of Paul because he was fully committed uh, to the Lord and he wanted to make sure that the gospel went forth. So that was Paul's concern. And then verses 6 through 10, moving along, it says th this is Paul's encouragement. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and, and don't miss this, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. So Timothy brought good news. It's Proverbs 25 and verse 25 that says, <clears throat> Like cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a distant land. And so Timothy brings back this word in this report, and I don't think it's insignificant that he the, almost the first thing that he says is that they think kindly of us. Now, we give each other a hard time around here, I know. And sometimes we get involved with projects that aren't that savory, like moving a 600-pound filing cabinet downstairs that aren't made to move filing cabinets downstairs. And something that we'll say is, you know, man, I wish you hadn't got me involved with this because this was, this was a pain. This, this, this was difficult. But for these believers who are suffering for the name of God because Paul and, spoke, Paul, Paul and Silas came and spoke to them, their thoughts and their attitude toward Paul and Silas was one of kindness. They were grateful that Paul had brought the gospel to them. They weren't embittered. They weren't embittered that, you know, man, we had it made with all these idols. We didn't get beat up because we believed in these idols, but this Paul comes in and he starts preaching about Jesus, and man, I mean, people hate us, they beat us up, they throw us out. I mean, we're outcasts now because we believed in this. But you know what? We're grateful that someone cared enough about us to tell us about eternity ahead, to tell us that there is a heaven and a hell, to tell us that there is a Savior who died on the cross and rose again 
so that we might have life. And so their thoughts towards Paul were good. And, and if I'm Paul and I read that, I'm rejoicing because they, they get it. They get that the suffering of this present time is nothing to be compared to the glory to re be received later. Faith and love, again, is mentioned here uh, for the, at least the second time in this book and how that these things are uh, linked together. And we'll talk more about love in just a second there at the end of the, end of the book. But again, their faith, that is their trust in God, and their love, that is their love for each other and for the, for the Lord, were linked together such that they were still bearing a good testimony. Verse 7 says that Paul was comforted. He was comforted when he heard about these things. That same Proverbs 25, 25 is applicable. And look at verse 8. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. <clears throat> I believe that it was, uh, it was indeed the story of Joseph, as we call it. In one of the times that uh, the brothers came to Joseph, they did not know he was Joseph at that time, and it says that um, Joseph, obviously, he was wanting them to bring back Benjamin as a surety to prove that, prove that they weren't spies. And one of the brothers said, we can't bring the boy back. He says, because the life of our father is bound up in the life of the boy. Of course, applicable to the Lord Jesus uh, and the Father, God the Father. But also here, notice that Paul's life, that is what gave him the ability to move about and breathe and function, was bound up with these believers. He took it personally, and he wanted these believers to stand firm in the calling of God. And he says, what can we, what can we render to God? What thanks can we render uh, to, to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account. In other words, there is no thing on this earth that compares with the joy and the fulfillment of knowing that someone has believed God and that they are sealed for eternity. It kind of goes back to verse 19 of chapter 2. And he says, what is our crown of exaltation? And H.A. Ironsides goes into this, and actually I, I meant to bring the, the quote that he talks about this, but he agrees, and, and what I had suggested last time, that at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ, as we call it, where just believers will be evaluated for their life on this earth, <clears throat> he says that he believes, H.A. Ironsides, that everyone that we have influenced, and particularly say, uh, brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, will be around that judgment seat at that time. And that in and of itself, will be the crown of exaltation, the thing that, as it were, turn around and look, behold, I and the children you have given me, those that we have influenced for the gospel. And so he says, there's nothing that we can compare to this. And he says, night and day, we keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. Now, obviously, this letter was written because there was some confusion. We're going to get into that in chapter 4. There was some uncertainty. There was perhaps some lifestyles that needed to change and to be more sanctified. And he said there were still things that they needed to work on. And yet he was rejoicing that they were going on. And I, thought, I found that instructive. Because oftentimes we find in different groups of believers and say, well, you know, they got this wrong and they got this right and all of these things. And, and we evaluate on a spectrum that... I, I don't know, we've all got different spectrums, and we say, you know, these believers are closer to the right, and these are you know, a little bit off on this, this sort of thing. And Paul recognizes that, and he says, I mean, they were confused about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. I mean, we, we would look at someone today and say, you know, you, you think, what about the second coming and, and all of this? And yet, he was rejoicing that their faith and their love was sure. And so Paul was encouraged. And I think that we would do well to focus on the good and focus on the encouragement that we can gain from fellow believers. And so finally, in verses 11 through 13, is Paul's prayer. Paul's prayer for them. So he was concerned, he was encouraged, and now he is offering this prayer. And it says, Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. 
I mentioned last time regarding verse 17 of chapter 2 that it is always uh, a desire to see one's face when there is true love. <clears throat> this kind of mimics what we will read about in uh, chapter 4 here next time, Lord willing, and how that we are looking forward to seeing the face of the Lord Jesus. And because we love him and because our sins are forgiven, and because we have a relationship with him, we can look forward to that day. You know, if we didn't know him, if our sins weren't forgiven, you know, if we were going to hell, we would not want to see the face of the Lord Jesus. But because all those things are true, we have that desire. And so Paul himself also wanted to see these believers. And it's actually interesting to look. I think it's in Romans and in other places. He says, you know, God willing, I'm going to come see you. I can't wait to see you and embrace you because there is something about when all the prayers and all the encouragement through letters is, is realized and you see the fruit of your labors. And one day in eternity, we will have all that displayed for us. And it says, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you. For all people? For all those that are persecuting the believers there, for all those that are spitting in their faces and beating them with rods and, out, and throwing their children out of the, the district and all these things. Yes, for all people. Because do you know why? Because the world cannot compete with that type of testimony. We talked about Steve Saint the other day and how there, we didn't see it with the video that we watched, but he literally walked out on stage and put his arm around the man who killed his father many, many years ago. He says, the, the world, I mean, CNN was doing that story. I mean, who, who can explain that? Who can give a, a, a rational uh, reason for this man who had his father taken away by this man? And he says, you know, I love him and he's my brother in Christ. Well, obviously, there's nothing to compare to that. Because Jesus Christ and his love is life-changing, radically life-changing. And so he says, love all people, bound in uh, for the, the believers and for all people around, and just as we also do for you. And then verse 13, we mentioned earlier in the first meeting. It says, may establish your hearts without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Now, notice that this says, with all his saints. I believe that this, in particular, is actually not referring to what we would call the rapture. This is referring to after the seven years of tribulation, and we'll get into that in more detail uh, in chapter 4. But this is actually when the Lord Jesus comes back with all his saints, and he comes and he presents, and he comes down to the Mount of Olives, and here we have the King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. And he comes back with all his saints. And when he comes back with all his saints, he will have an army of believers who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus, who are there dressed in white because they were without blame and in holiness. And every eye will see the Lord Jesus. And we want him to be the attention when he will receive the glory that he finally deserves. But it's just like the Lord to share in that moment with his saints. That he is bringing along his saints to be with him in this moment. And so he says, without blame and holiness. If you would turn back to the book of Jude. And again, one of my favorite verses. Jude 24 says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling... And to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Can you imagine? And sometimes, I will admit, maybe you have a better imagination than I do. You probably do. I'm just an old black and white engineer. But can you imagine? In that day, when the Lord Jesus comes with all his saints, and every eye will see him, every television camera, every 
social media post. If that exists, at that time, if I was the Lord, I'd just do away with it. But at any rate, every eye will see him. And you will start reading, you know, people perhaps will take their Bibles and they will read verses like that. To him be the glory and dominion and majesty forever and ever and amen. And we as his saints are gathered around the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the lamb once slain. And we are there giving him glory and honor that he deserves. But, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> but before that day, in the day in which we live right now, we can give to him and render to him the glory that he deserves. And so that was Paul's prayer for these saints, that they might be established with this same mindset of holiness and blamelessness. And uh, I mentioned uh, perhaps an example of this was King David after his sin with Bathsheba. And when he was ta talking to uh, Nathan, the prophet, and Nathan said, you've sinned. And David says, I have sinned. And Nathan says, your sins have been forgiven. But... Because you have given cause for the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme the name of the Lord, there is going to be consequences. And so there you have David's forgiveness. That is, he was made right and holy before God, but he was not without blame. And won't that be a tremendous day when no one will be able to bring a charge against his elect? It says that in Romans. In that day, we will be spared the embarrassment of sinning against the Lord. We will not be able to bring shame to the name of the Lord. And I look forward to that because all too often I don't give him the glory he deserves. I don't render to him the praise that he deserves. And that will be something that we look forward to. So this prayer, the final prayer here, verses 11 through 13, is something that we should pray for all believers. And I think that that's an appropriate prayer for each one of us here this morning, that he would establish us and make us look forward to that day. And really, starting, this actually is a good segue into chapter 4. It's almost like he had a purpose in writing it. Chapter 4 talks about how that our life has to be different. There are things that you might have done previously in this wicked city that you can't do anymore. And then he leads up, and here's the reason why. It's because Jesus Christ is coming back. And I <clears throat> look forward to that. We were talking about it this morning, that Jesus Christ is coming back. I certainly look forward to that day. No more sin, no more pain. And we look forward to being with our Savior. But we certainly want to make sure that everyone that we know and love has heard the gospel and received it. And I would say that if you are under the sound of my voice today and you have not put your tr trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. I truly believe, I, I agree with Paul, I, I, I believe that the Lord Jesus will come back in my lifetime. And I'm younger than Paul, so, I mean, we got even more, more time than that. But I believe that the Lord Jesus will come back, and I believe his coming is imminent, and I look forward to that. But if you are not saved, you have nothing to look forward to, and I hope that you will come to God on his terms and accept him as your Savior. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to consider your word. Father, we just ask for your help in this, this day, this day of, of pain and angst and frustration, hate, and division, animosity. Father, we realize that you are the one who can unite us. You are the one who can bring peace to the troubled soul. And Father, we would ask that you would do that this morning for those who are hurting, those who are sick. Father, those who are uh, facing different trials and different burdens. Lord, we ask your help. But Father, we pray for those who have not put their trust in the Lord Jesus in our family, in our workplace, in our schools, in our just daily interaction. Father, there is a judgment coming. And we would pray, Father, that the gospel of Jesus Christ might go forward in strong uh, terms to those people, even today. And whether it be under the sound of, of this message or some other message or some other testimony in this world, this town, this place, that the gospel would penetrate the hearts of men and that they would understand it, and that the evil one would not come and take it away. Father, we ask that you would help us now to live blamelessly and holy lives before you. We thank you again for this opportunity. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen.